So my brothers and my sisters, as we embrace this urgency of creating the beloved community, now is the time to be loved. Love means understanding, redemptive goodwill toward all which seeks nothing in return. So be loved by implementing the demands of justice to eliminate the school to prison pipeline that has so many black children entrapped. Be loved by correcting voting policies that seek to suppress the votes of millions of black and brown people. Be loved and implement the demands of justice by transforming a society that is disproportionately violent toward black lives, including black transgendered lives and indigenous lives. Be loved and correct false narratives and economic policies that continue to divide and pit poor and working class black and white people against each other. Be loved and implement demands of justice where systems and structures are deconstructed and lead the way of living in community that reimagines just humane, equitable, and sustainable policies, practices, and behaviors. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them who hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and abuse you. Be love and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Beloved Community Talks. Hello and welcome to all of you from all over the world. Thank you so much for being a part of this Beloved Community Talks experience. We're grateful for you. I want to share what uh, Beloved Community Talks are all about. But before we do that, before I do that, rather, we have... Uh, very special team with us for this experience. We have pro bono American Sign Language, Mr. DeBlois Hitchman joining us to be sure that we communicate with as many people as possible and that we honor as many communities, all of them, uh, that we can. So this beloved Community Talks experience is about don't stop for justice. We wanna talk about the impact of uh, the March on Washington for March and Freedom and of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Saturday will commemorate the 58th anniversary of the march and of the speech. And uh, it would just be uh, not right of us if we did not express, share, convey, and do some teaching on the powerful impact, the influence that that speech and that march continue to have. So we'll do that by way of some beloved community talks. Now you may be asking, what is the beloved community? We want to be sure we get some understanding about that before we get started. The vision of the King Center is that we envision the beloved community where injustice ceases and love prevails. So, uh, of course, we want to have some conversations, courageous conversations around how we get to that beloved community. And in fact, in this experience today, we'll express and share how Dr. King's dream was a part of getting to that beloved community. That's what his dream was all about. So the beloved community is not a utopia. Mrs. Coretta Scott King, the founder of the King Center, shared that the beloved community is an achievable society. We can get there. That is not without tension and conflict. There's some conflict, but that conflict is resolved peacefully and without bitterness. So there's an approach and we do all of that, get into the beloved community with nonviolence, which the King Center calls Nonviolence 365. This continues to be a journey for us, this journey of nonviolence, this journey of getting to the beloved community. And the beloved community, that pathway has some components. One of those components is earnest, hard, difficult, challenging, courageous conversations. And so we're here on this day, where well, certainly we've seen uh, today the results of what Dr. King called the triple evils. And we've seen today militarism, war, uh, slash war. We've seen uh, some racism today, I'm sure you've witnessed. 
in what you've encountered and poverty. But we want to talk about as we mourn, as we pray for uh, our neighbors, the people of Afghanistan, the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers who died there today, and the families who have been impacted by violence. Uh, there's a way for us to, in this challenging moment, reach back and uh, bring that dream forward that Dr. King had, that we can share with you today what that dream means for now and what the March on Washington in 1963 means for today. We're gonna to get into that. We're gonna do that before we get started. I just wanna pause for a moment and acknowledge again uh, the devastation in Afghanistan today. Um, and as we talk about the dream, what does the dream mean for the future? Can that dream, can us grabbing hold of that dream help us to decrease these instances and moments of violence and injustice in what Dr. King called our world house. Again, welcome. On behalf of King Center CEO, Dr. Bernie Say King, it is good for us to be here together. We have as our first guest, as we discuss the March on Washington and I have a dream, a great man who was a part of the movement, a negotiator. Uh, if you study with us, you'll study these principles and steps of nonviolence as we call what we call nonviolence 365 as a a step called negotiation, and he was masterful at it. And so we wanted him to join us today to talk about what he remembers about the March on Washington. And I have a dream as he was then a leader and a part of the team that made it happen. So we wanna to welcome today, Ambassador Andrew Young. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you, sir, uh, welcome. It's good to have you. I was just thinking back um, I was 31, mm. 1963, and we had just come out of the Birmingham movement. Well, the Birmingham movement, almost everybody but me got arrested. <laughs> uh, and, um, <coughs> but by and large, the key to the Birmingham movement was that before we started demonstrations, we started negotiations. Mm. Uh, and uh, Dr. King said to me, Andy, don't you know some white folks in Birmingham? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I haven't been to Birmingham much. He said, well, see if you can find some. <laughs> and um, and that's how I started. I, I found the Episcopal Church and asked the bishop if he would <coughs> uh negotiations or set up a, a if he would agree to meet martin luther king and ralph abernathy wyatt walker and uh fred shuttlesworth and i said and it would be good if you could bring some of the business community with you and so what we did was we told them exactly what our battle plan was and why we were there it was a very cordial meeting uh, Dr. King was masterful. He said, look, we are brothers, but we've not been able to live together as brothers. Hmm. Uh, we feel that the system puts, you have to put a foot on our neck to keep us down. Uh, and that keeps you down in the gutter also. And what we're trying to do is just fix our relationships so that we can stand side by side as brothers and work together. Uh, and um, that was the beginning of the, that was where the March on Washington started. In Birmingham? Uh, well, oh, coming that, out of Birmingham. Well, coming out of Birmingham, because mm -hmm. see, that was really the first of January. And we, we kept the demonstrations going we stopped the whole town from buying anything but food or medicine for 90 days. So the boycott was very important part, but the demonstration, the demonstration started, but they didn't start till almost March because there was an election. And, um, once they started, the whole town was involved. The entire school system, uh, shut down and, uh, the 2nd of May, we had declared desegregation <laughs> day and all of the schools, just all of the high schools, they say it was a children's march, but these were high schoolers that were 
you know, 14, 15, 16. Well, what we said was, if you're going to be able to go to Vietnam or Korea and get killed once you graduate at 18, you ought to be able to go to jail and demonstrate in your own hometown for your own family and human rights. And so it was part of that demonstration that we actually got the Birmingham business community to agree to almost everything that was in the Voting Rights Act, I mean, in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, yes, sir. We left Birmingham. And then when we, we left, when we stopped, uh, Bevel and uh, Fred Shuttlesworth and mm. the others got what we call Freedom High. They didn't want to stop. They want to go to Birmingham. Let's go on to Nashville. Let's go on from Nashville to Richmond. And let's go on. Let's turn out every city between here and Washington. Well, that really wasn't practical. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, Bide Rustin sent, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Randolph, A. Philip Randolph, sent Bide Rustin down to, uh, to Birmingham to talk with us. And they said, and that this was the purpose of the March on Washington, that we had a powerful Southern movement, but it was Southern and it was black. And yes, sir. in order yes. to bring about change, we, we feel powerful and we are powerful when we're controlling the streets. But ultimately in the nation, we're 13, 14% of the population. So we have to build a coalition of goodwill um, to get, uh, to get any real change. And so Byard said that a Philip Randolph had been willing and trying to organize on March, uh, from, uh, New York to Washington. And he wanted us to wait until August and we would bring in the nation, uh, to Washington, uh, toward the end of August. Well, the truth of it is most of us in SCLC felt like we'd done our part and we were ready to take a risk. So we didn't even want to go to the March on Washington. We thought that was going to be a, a Sunday school picnic. And we figured we were the fighters. <clears throat> and uh, it wasn't until the day of, the day before the march that Dr. King called me and said, you better get your butt up here. <laughs> He said, you, you, you will regret it the rest of your life if you're not here. And so my wife and I went on up and um, it was really an incident. Uh, and uh, it was a demonstration that took us from being a Southern black movement to being a national and even international international movement. Yes, movement that was multi let me ask you, Ambassador Young, you shared a number of things just in opening this beloved community talks experience. And one of the things you conveyed is a coalition, that there was a coalition, but there was also some cohesion between what was happening in Birmingham and what was happening or what would happen in Washington, D.C. I just want to ask you, um, as we want to focus on the influence and the impact of this march, what what's teachable from that today? What can we learn from um, pulling all of this together and seeing how Birmingham flowed into Washington, D.C.? And then what we learn from D.C., we see in Selma voting rights uh, issues and, and direct we, action concerning and voting. Created, continue. What the March on Washington created was it created a national coalition of goodwill, mm -hmm. It created a national beloved community because the churches came along, uh, the stars came from Hollywood. There was a, a, a plane load uh, with Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, uh, Dorothy Dandridge. Uh, all, Lena Horne, I saw Lena Horne in Bethlehem. Yeah, Lena Horne was there and uh, I can't remember them all. Uh, Marlon Brando. Yes, sir, James Garner, there were a number. Yeah. Yes, you, you know almost everybody in that that uh, mm -hmm. that got off that plane. Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, all of those became 
our fundraisers for the movement. You see, and so for the rest of the movement, that team that came from Hollywood held benefits that kept that supported the movement. Uh, and it was joined later on by Aretha Franklin, who was a little too young in 63, uh, but who was one of our, our leading stars in the later years. Um, and, and so the March on Washington created that coalition. Coming down from New York, we had organized labor. Uh, we had business representatives, but not too many. Um, we had college presidents and uh, uh, the university community. Uh, we had Roman Catholic uh, spokespersons at the march. Uh, the Jewish community was very strongly represented. Mm. Uh, and we presented a coalition of goodwill on the steps of the uh, Lincoln Memorial. And everybody focused on Martin Luther King's speech, which was the most important. And he summarized it all. The irony of it is everybody wanted to speak first <laughs> because they figured that they didn't know what it was going to be. And they thought that uh, uh, the press would be gone. Uh, it was starting at 12 o'clock. The press would be gone by one o'clock. They'd get the first few people. Truth of it is nobody left. Everybody was waiting on Dr. King's message. And what he did was he made public the association of the Bible, the Constitution, and our civil rights movement. And he spoke with the authority of the prophets, uh, but with the wisdom of the writers of the Constitution. And he translated it in that they only gave him nine minutes to speak. <laughs> And he only spoke for nine minutes in his written part. But then Mahalia Jackson was there and she kept saying, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. <laughs> and then he took off and started preaching. And that's what everybody remembered. And that's, you know, how important uh, when you talk about Dr. King's moral authority and him bringing the Constitution and Bible together in that moment. And, and you mentioned a, a coalition of goodwill. How important is that today? if we were able to form that and to also have some moral authority in the movement? Well, look at right now in order to get the voting rights bill, which incidentally has passed four times before the Senate. The last time was under President Bush. Mm. It was renewed uh, and 97 senators voted for it. But we've had such a setback uh, that uh, the election, I mean, the voting laws that are coming up now are, are being passed by one party. That wasn't the case. Um, in fact, we had a bipartisan coalition uh, that was put together by the churches, the trade union movements, the universities. And we're only 14, 13, 14% of the population. Uh, so you can't pass any law just by black people. Uh, it's got to be a coalition of goodwill or a coalition of conscience or a beloved community uh, that transforms the soul of America. Uh, and that that's more well, that's that's a coalition that cannot be vetoed. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's uh, when we talk about the beloved community. I, I remember a quote from Dr. King. He, he said that he wouldn't join with any group that didn't believe we could form a coalition of conscience. And that's a paraphrase. But that really reminds us of what happened with that march and with I Have a Dream. When we think about the content of I Have a Dream, how Dr. King expressed uh, the conditions of the nation, um, when, you, when you consider what he spoke then, how do we grab hold of that dream today when we really talk about the influence and impact of it and some of the things you've mentioned about the soul force? And maybe that's the first question. Uh, how important is it for us to have some soul force today? Well, I think that... Um... 
I think that, that that's what that's what we have, but we haven't articulated it yet. I mean, Black Lives Matter, ha the world having to watch uh, the death of George Floyd. Um, it wasn't an intellectual issue. It wasn't a political issue. It was a moral issue. That's it right. got to the very soul of everybody that saw it. And we said, we cannot live in a nation that's like this. And we've got to find a way to transform the soul of America so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. And I think that we were not reluctant to use religious language. Uh, and I think that, that it's a little more difficult uh, for this generation, uh, but actually it's the same spirit. They haven't figured out how they're going to define it in their time. Mm -hmm. But uh, what Dr. Barber is doing with poverty is a continuation of what Dr. King said. We, we're going to redeem the soul of America from the triple evils of racism, war, and poverty. Uh, we did, we, we've made, you know, nobody wants us to be in, in, in Afghanistan. And we are possibly, the possibility of this withdrawal uh, and in the process of withdrawing, we're redefining our relationship with the Taliban. Uh, and um, I think the challenge of diplomacy in this day and age is to develop a coalition of conscience on global issues. And that's, mm. I mean, that's what I saw uh, with the trial, that it was a demonstration that there was a coalition of goodwill in this nation that could speak through a judicial system that has many problems in its own right. Uh, but on this, uh, everybody had to be of one mind and one heart and one spirit. And um, now for the voting rights position, um, we're going to, we're going to see, uh, we're going to see that, that we have a coalition, a beloved community. Now in, in Atlanta, for instance, uh, there were probably as many students from Georgia state and Georgia tech marching as there were from the AU center simply because there are more, there are twice as many students in each of those. Uh, and we had students from all over uh, marching under the banner of Black Lives Matter. We did in fact have a beloved community uh, mm -hmm. that was out there marching. Uh, and the press has a way of uh, focusing only on the violence and the well, we used to say that if it bleeds, it leads. And if nobody's getting hurt or getting killed, you get it's no not a lead story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How would you encourage this generation to, to tap into or to pull from Dr. King's dream? Sometimes we only quote the end or the media only gives us the end without giving us some of the, the conditions that he expressed. But with where we are now, what can we do well, with that dream? What, what we need to remember is that Martin Luther King went to Morehouse when he was 15. Mm. And um, he was just an ordinary student um, who I think didn't really find himself until toward the end of his college career. Uh, and, um, but, uh, one of his professors uh, made uh, Mrs. King mad when she said, he said, you know, at Morehouse, we didn't consider Martin Luther King one of our better students. <laughs> and nobody considered me one of the better students at Howard University. I mean, I, I graduated, oh, thank you, Lordy. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but there was something that happened to us spiritually. Um, 
toward the end of our college careers that charted us on a pathway that though we couldn't articulate it yet, that we were ready to redeem the soul of America uh, from the triple evils of racism, war, and poverty. Those are Dr. King's words. Uh, and that was uh, found in the founding of SCOC in 1957. Mm. Uh, Do you think that's the war. foundation of his dream? When you think about that entire speech, was that about redeeming the soul of America by eradicating those evils? Well, it, it, it actually was. And we, we all talked about that in, poverty, in private. I mean, wow. that was the motivator. Um, in fact, I remember him saying, um, you know, we've got to be clinically insane to think that a crazy bunch like y'all and he was talking about himself but he was talking about jose williams and james bevel and white walker and ralph abernathy and burn i mean james orange and jt johnson and i mean the whole i mean there was nobody there that was particularly distinguished <laughs> uh but everybody there was prepared to give their life to follow him. Uh, and nobody was concerned about their own suffering. Uh, they were committing to redeem the soul of America from these triple evils. And he said, we probably won't make it to 40, but if we make it past 40, we got to make it to a hundred because this is not a easy way to work. I, it is not an easy burden. Uh, and uh, that's the title I used for, for my book on the movement. Uh, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me because my yoke is easy and my mm, burden is light. light. Yeah, and it was so that it, it was always spiritual power that motivated us and that made for the changes uh, that we were trying to uh, extract from the society. And we were trying to redeem the soul of America. Uh, and um, that was a theme that followed his life, and it was a theme that that follows us to this day. It is. You, you've said it several times, sir, and I think that's resonating with us as we consider, even the audience, thinking about this march. And uh, there'll be more marches Saturday, and there'll be events Saturday in commemoration of the anniversary. And I only imagine what that will look like if we really understand uh, that we can redeem the soul of this nation and then throughout our world house eradicate these triple evils. Well, and the marching is simply a way of gathering together the people of goodwill. But the work goes on much more quiet. Yes. And, and it, it has to be sustained over long periods of time because nothing happens easily. Dr. King was 33 uh, 34, uh, when he made that speech, see, I mean, and he was other than John Lewis, he was probably the youngest speaker there. Wow. But that was the most powerful speech that anybody had heard, uh, since Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Ambassador. I, I've learned so much in these 30 minutes, and I'm sure our audience has. And thank you for your work. You've talked about you talked about work over time, but you've been working for a long time, and we appreciate it. We're grateful for you. Oh, it's not. It's not just. I don't consider it work. It's my way of life. Mm. And um, there's no limit to what you can do if you don't mind who gets the credit. 
Mm. And if you don't want to get rich. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. You Thank you for your way of life. You can make changes. <clears throat> Excellent, sir. Thank you so well, much. We appreciate one having one you more with us. We leave, Absolutely. I think, I think the beloved community is followed up by the city of Atlanta. Because I think that, that uh, the night before he went to Memphis, he talked about how are we are going to get the energy in the streets into public policy and into public life. And um, on his death, Maynard Jackson started running for the Senate. Uh, well, he couldn't get elected then. It was too early, but he riled up the black community and I got elected to Congress. And I think, I think we need to see the progress of Atlanta from a city of a mi half a million people to a metropolis of almost 7 million now. Um, and the explosion of education in this city. Uh, which is not only black people, but it's black and white. The, the awakening of, of the conscience of America in Atlanta uh, is something that uh, we've got to continue. And it's more and more difficult now because we have to kind of make this city expressing the meaning of a beloved community. And you can't have a beloved community if you have 3,400 kids mm. on the street homeless. So it, it's it's a wide variety of things. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So that's a part of seeing the dream realized, too. Uh, the work in Atlanta, the work in the nation, and the work across the globe. Thank you, Ambassador Young. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, you, I know. I just popped in. You, you know, it just in. happens. I it it happens that way. It happens that way. Yeah. Um, uh, Uncle Andy, that's how I, I know him to, to all the people who listen from around the world. Um, he's been affectionately called that uh, since I came out of my mother's womb. Uh, but I, I want to thank you uh, so much, uh, Uncle Andy. You pro provided so much uh, poignant insight tonight. Um, and and I have to I have to say this as a joke. You were so clear tonight, in, in a way that I haven't seen in a while. So I really uh, appreciate it because we need that clarity. We need to understand what built up to the march on Washington, um, what it was really about, and how we can draw strength from it and guidance from it in this time. And so you're one of our um, elders in the village, and I don't mean that by age. I mean that by wisdom and experience. No um, and we appreciate we appreciate it, and we thank God for you, and we continue to pray that God gives you the strength uh, just to continue guiding and, and leading us uh, uh, through these you know difficult waters. I know, and you know, uh, as Daddy said, that moral arc is long and bends towards justice. But those of us who are fighting for freedom and justice and equality um, are helping to bend that, and we know. Uh, that, as my mama used to say, the darkest hours before the dawn, but right. the dawn is coming. If we just keep applying uh, uh, the, the pressure, we keep working quietly, like you said, behind the scenes and, and with sustainability um, and recognize nothing comes easy, uh, but uh, we can achieve it. And, and so, yes, we, the beloved community, the National Coalition of Goodwill, my God. <laughs> so, Wasn't that so thank great? You again. It was very great. Yeah. Very great. I got a new word. Very great. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I Amen. love you and I'm proud of all love you, you too. to do. Thank you, you so nice much. I love you. Man. Say that again. I said I when I saw the team, you've got a nice looking team. Oh, thank you. I'm sure they would appreciate that. They, they're great people. Listening to Dr. West, 
you you all are carrying on very very well. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. But all right. Listen, what a wow. great one. Now I know many of you saying. What do you mean by love? Because people have so many different understandings of love. What I am talking about is not the powerless, the weak, and the anemic love. No, no, no. I'm talking about be love and implement the demands of justice. Be love and use your power to correct everything that stands against love. The urgency of now is to dig in and create the beloved community by rising up to be loved. Let's go forward in this moment and bridge the divides. Let's go forward to create the beloved community. Let's go forward and rise up to be loved. Welcome back. Uh, that was a message from the King Center about Be Love. Be Love is a global uh, mission, global movement for justice that the King Center launched earlier this year. And so we invite you to go to the kingcenter.org and take the pledge and join us for the Be Love movement. We want to implement the demands of justice across the globe. So be a part of that. Sign up for that. And thank you again for being a part of this uh, beloved community talks today. We have a new pro bono American Sign Language team member with us now, uh, providing sign language, Flo McHenry. Welcome, Flo. Thank you so much for your service for this beloved community talks experience. What a powerful first segment with Ambassador Andrew Young and then with Dr. Bernie Say King, our CEO, coming on for the end of that segment. So grateful for his wisdom, for his clarity, for how he talked about cohesion and this coalition of goodwill, our pathway to the beloved community, and how the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech reflected a desire from Dr. King and the other leaders of that march and of the movement to redeem the soul of America by eradicating the triple evils which Dr. King also called the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and poverty, or as he in one place, one to two places called it, extreme materialism. So we want to continue this conversation and, and joining us next in this segment, you just saw her at the end of that uh, first segment with Ambassador Young, the CEO of the King Center, orator, leader, thought leader, uh, world leader, uh, great speaker and, and thinker concerning issues across the world, Dr. Bernie Say King. Let's bring Dr. King on as we continue our conversation. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. back. Do you have any additional comments about that first segment? No, I'm just inspired. I mean, Me too. That was I my was, word. I was, I was about to say yeah. I was inspired. I, I was really moved by uh, his words, and I hope people really took them to heart because it yeah. is it is we're in that season now that it's going to require uh, a coalition of goodwill and conscience, uh, the mm -hmm. beloved community banding together uh, in that sustained way. Uh, to address and eliminate these triple evils of poverty, racism, and, and militarism. Yeah, it was a multifaceted coalition, Dr. King. He talked about faith groups, uh, corporations. Yeah. Hollywood. Hollywood. Uh, organized labor. Yes. Um, they really set the foundation and the groundwork for much of what we are seeing today. Many Many of the movements uh, that have occurred since the latter part of the 60s uh, with the Vietnam War going forward uh, really, I believe, took a lot of their uh, guidance uh, from the civil rights movement um, and the work that they did. And, and uh, you know, they, they really did a great job of uh, mobilizing and organizing and strategizing. I mean, they were perfect. You know, there were some... Uh, challenges. There were some areas where they, they had to learn some lessons, uh, but certainly, my God, uh, you know, what they did 
uh, provided such a solid foundation for, for us today. Yes. And to, to hear Ambassador Young talk about spiritual matters and how we mm-hmm. often shun that today, but they understood then soul force and that even though we may not have embraced it today, this still is a spiritual matter, a soul matter uh, that, that we might not know it or know how to articulate it, but we're still in a moment where we need that soul force. Definitely. I mean, you, you can't do it without that that soul force. I mean, the forces that we are, are dealing with are so treacherous now. Um, and, and as we call it, the sophistication uh, of many of the tactics today, they're not as black and white, no, no pun intended and not, nothing to you know, identify it in terms of people. But, uh, you know, it, it, it really is going to take uh, a very concerted, collaborative, co- coordinated uh, effort out of our souls and spirit uh, to attack uh, these, these evils. Because, you know, the, the strange thing is we, we keep attacking each other. <laughs> because, you know, unfortunately, all of us are either vessels for good or vessels for evil. And so it's hard to kind of sift through, you know, this is something else uh, that's much greater than what's, this, you know, this, this person who may be doing these evil things. Uh, so we've got to figure out how do we, you know, divorce ourselves from the evils and connect with each other to fight you know, the poverty, the racism, we, we almost need to detach and say, okay, we created a generation before us and generations before us may have, you know, brought us to this point. Um, but we got to detach from it and really try to re-engage by creating a new uh, foundation, extracting those things that are good. Because everything, I mean, we have to say it, everything about the United States of America is not bad and evil. There have been people who have taken concepts and thoughts and ideals and they have manipulated it for their power and control and advantage um, and hurt and damaged uh, people and killed and destroyed people and communities. Uh, But those ideals, that's what he was talking about. Daddy was appealing to some very powerful ideas that synchronized uh, with the scriptures. Um, And that's what we have to hold tight to. Um, as 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 the United States of America, as a global community, you know, um, it really is about ushering in the beloved community. And for those of us in the Christian community, we understand that is the kingdom of God, mm. where love prevails, as we say. Yeah, and justice, justice ceases and love prevails. Yes. That's the vision. And uh, as we bring on our, our next two conversationalists, we want to stay in that vein to start to think about what we want to leave people with uh, in this beloved community talk, some action, some things that we can do, some tangible steps for how we uh, reconnect to this dream and get the fundamental components of it and say, hey, we need some soul force. We need a coalition. And as, as we like to talk about, we need to, as your father said, and where do we go from here, chaos or community, uh, organize our strength That's into true. compelling power. So that the government, he said, cannot elude our demands. That's what they did with that march on Washington in Birmingham and Selma and Montgomery. So as we continue the conversation, we want to invite Mr. Charles Alfin to join us. He's our senior trainer, senior nonviolence trainer at the King Center, retired captain with the St. Louis Police Department. Welcome, Mr. Alfin. I think he's muted. You're still muted, Mr. Allison. You're still muted, Charles. We know you want to talk to us. You're muted, you're, sir. You're muted. You got to unmute. There you there go. There you go. Well, yes. Well, thank you again, Dr. West and Dr. King. Good to see you again. And what a magnificent Let's message. Uh, so simple by Honorable Andrew Young. I really, really enjoyed it. And I uh, hope he's still listening. But he was my teacher at the King Center. Of Mrs. Cross Scott King invited me down. In 81, he and John Lewis and, and C.T. Vivian and Dr. Lafayette. So it's always a pleasure to hear it's very simple. And he convinced me, one of the people that convinced me with Mrs. Coretta Scott King, that this philosophy really works. Didn't he? He talked like a course in 30 minutes. I, I yeah. He's, 
Yeah. Uh, and what he shared, yeah. he conveyed so much of what we share when we talk about nonviolence and when we talk about the beloved community to describe it as a coalition of goodwill and to talk about how we need to realize it and see it in a city like Atlanta, which lets us know we need to see it from city to city, from heart to heart. So welcome, Mr. Alphon. We also have joining us our senior director of research, education and program operations at the King Center, professor, scholar, a great scholar on uh, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, the founder of the King Center, as well as many historical figures and issues and topics. Dr. Kalisha Graves joins us as well. Welcome, good Dr. Graves. Good evening. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm well. Y'all looking so well. You know, we do the best we can when we can. So. <laughs> you know, you know, I have to say this has nothing to do with the conversation, but I'm looking at my screen and Dr. West, Dr. Graves, your colors are synchronizing. And then on this side, I see uh, 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 Mr. Alfred Mr. and Alfred myself and, and our Just colors are synchronizing. Isn't that something? Hey, we, we right. Wow. We did. This is the the more we're talking today, the more energized I'm becoming around how we can connect this dream to what we need to see today and how what we're learning about the March on Washington is so fundamentally important to the work that we need to continue today as well. So we just want to continue that and to inspire people. There, there's so much happening in the world and we need inspiration, but we also need information and we need some things that help us take steps forward. So, uh, Mr. Alphon, I want to just ask you a, a question because uh, Ambassador Young mentioned the beloved community, he talked a, a bit about nonviolence. When we think about nonviolence, how do we see it integrated in Washington with the March on Washington? And as we talked about negotiation and direct action, what are we looking at today? How do we translate that that we saw then into now? and be even more effective in our action? Well, thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent question. And sometimes we forget because we get tied up in the action, the marching. And as uh, Andrew Young said, that you have to work quietly behind the scenes. And what I saw and read in March on Washington, I was in the service in Portland, Oregon. I was not in the, um, in the March on Washington, but as I read and talk about it, they were working very hard behind the scenes and they had a, a coalition of conscience that we are just uh, amazed at how they were able to bring in people that could organize a march from June to August. And remember, they didn't start on that to June. They met in July and August 28th, they were mobilized. So therefore they were doing a lot of, of uh, organi organizing behind the scene a lot of education, that's the uh, second step of nonviolence. They were telling people why they should go, what, what is in it for them, and they were making a, um, a grassroots bottom-up movement because Congress was in a stalemate. They were in a filibuster. So March on Washington let people who wanted to get involved to get involved, but it also let people who were leaders to begin to negotiate, as, as Andrew Young said, they were negotiating behind the scene, talked to the president before they came, President John Kennedy, who wasn't really happy with them coming. And so they had to convince uh, John Kennedy that they were not asking to come, they were coming. And so, uh, and it did in the spirit of nonviolence or coalition building, they understood that uh, we're all here together and we can't alienate anybody. They had internal uh, conflict that they worked out through the six principles because Dr. King always adhered to those six principles and steps. And there was conflict. There were there were egos. There were people wanting to speak first. And Brian Ruskin just did a magnificent job of organizing over 2,000 leaders that were able to come in and uh, make that, that a success. And as a, um, a, a footnote, they were 30 minutes ahead. So they were not lagging behind three or four hours. Uh, they were uh, ahead of time with the March on Washington. And they, and they got in and got out with a powerful message. Dr. Wow. West. I, I just wanted to add a little bit of context to the prelude of the March on Washington because I Absolutely. don't want people to think uh, that the the, the, the 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 organizing and difficult work they did in two months didn't have a foundation prior to. So A. Philip Randolph, who was kind of looked upon as the elder statesman of the civil rights movement, 
uh, was the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping uh, Car Porters. In 1941, um, under FDR, um, he was seeking the call together a march at that time because, uh, uh, you know, there was discrimination in terms of hiring, in terms of the government and defense uh, uh, work. Um, and uh, he wanted to call a march on Washington around that. Um, and uh, <laughs> the, 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 the president called him in and said that he would do an executive order um, uh, to forbid discrimination um, in defense uh, and government work uh, and also establish uh, the uh, Federal uh, Employment Practice Committee, which didn't last but five years because uh, Congress kind of defunded it. So it, it, it dissolved, unfortunately. And many of the things that he was laying the foundation for uh, to uh, uh, come against all of the discrimination in those two areas, you know, for the most part, we didn't realize what he was trying to realize. And so you fast forward to 19, I think it was 57, where there was a, uh, uh, a march uh, and they and A. Philip Randolph, Randolph again relied upon the organized, organizing prowess of the NAACP and the appeal of my father at that time, because this was on the hill of the uh, Montgomery bus protest. Uh, prayer pilgrimage, I think it was, at the March okay. on Washington, at the Lincoln Memorial. Um, it was the third anniversary uh, of Brown versus Board of Education. And, and, and as we know, you know, laws pass. So it's more important. We have to understand we can't just get the laws passed. We got to make right. sure that we're superintending those laws so they carry out their intended purpose. And so there had not been any follow through on Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, so they, they marched on Washington. I think it was about 20, close to 25,000 at that time um, who participated in, in that uh, march on Washington. So you fast forward again, didn't see much progress. So, you know, we get to the, the sit-ins uh, in, in 60 and then, you know, the, uh, the Freedom Ride 61. And then, you know, you go into Albany and then Birmingham in 63. Um, and so in the wake of all that was happening in Birmingham, we were in Birmingham was the water hoses, the billy clubs, uh, uh, the, the dogs and daddy's letter from the Birmingham jail and Bull Connor, you know, who was a, a staunch uh, segregationist. Uh, in fact, my father called him, um, uh, I think he said the most racist, but he, 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 he did call him a That's racist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and because of all of that, it, 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 that movement began to build the momentum uh, for the March of Washington, but, it's kind of like the Women's Political Council was trying to boycott the buses in Montgomery before the mm -hmm. actual bus boycott. Well, A. Philip Randolph was trying to call these marches on Washington to deal with the discrimination uh, related to uh, Black Americans. Uh, and so 1963 became uh, what 1955 the bus boycott was to the Women's Political Council. 1963 March on Washington is what what became the the manifestation of what A. Philip Randolph was trying to do starting in 1941. 41. So I just want I want I want I wanted to give that that foundation. So they were kind of prime uh, for this this moment uh, of planning a march for jobs and justice, and, and SEOC wanted to do a march for freedom. And I think A. Philip Randolph and By Rustin, who worked very closely with him wanted to do it around jobs. And so I think the conversation became a merger of the two. Um, and uh, we can we can go forth. I just wanted to lay that foundation. Oh, thank you so much. And you know, you're mentioning the Women's Political Council in Montgomery is a great segue to say, let's talk about the women. Uh, the <laughs> women who were a key part of planning and organizing and being a part of uh, the March on Washington. Uh, and even as we heard Ambassador Young, Dr. Gray, say, uh, Mahalia Jackson was saying, tell them about the dream, Martin. <laughs> Can yeah. you share with us what women did to, to make this march happen and how critical oh, they were? Oh, indeed. You know, women really were the tendons and ligaments and the sinew that really enabled the civil rights movement in general to walk, but certainly uh, that enabled the March on Washington. One of the, uh, there were so many women who were central, but Dorothy Height, who was over the National Council of Negro Women was central to planning. Of course, she uh, didn't speak at 
the march, but she was central to rallying women and um, creating, uh, 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 generating energy among um, among women to assist in the movement. Of course, you had those unsung women, right? Those unsung right. heroines who ensured that that folks were fed, right? That people um, uh, ha had transportation, et cetera. Uh, there was actually the only woman who spoke at the march was Daisy Bates. So, and Daisy Bates was a uh, NAACP president in Arkansas, as well as associated with the Little Rock Nine. She was the advisor for the Little Rock Nine. And so Daisy Bates was the only woman who spoke at the march. There was a section on the program of the march, which was a tribute to Negro women. And there were about six women listed there. And so Daisy Bates spoke for about really just over a minute and really what she she just talked about the women's commitment to help um support the march but it's interesting because there were so many women present present you had lena yes. horn diane carroll mrs king mahalia jackson now mahalia jackson and marion anderson both sang but in terms of who articulated right who was the who was um the, the one woman who was able to articulate on behalf of other women uh, it was Daisy Bates, but um, certainly, it, you know, in reflecting on it, it was almost in a way as powerful as March on Washington was the fact that more women weren't uh, given a platform to articulate. It, it really was in some ways a missed um, opportunity, but Daisy Bates held down for the sisters, so we appreciate that. But yeah, women- And, and, really and she was and she, and she was in the place of Merle Epp. Evers, who exactly. was actually supposed to speak, exactly. but her flight, something happened with her flight. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Indeed. Listen, but, Indeed. but all the women now, when I think about mm -hmm. how uh, that moment kind of catapulted us and, and how women are so intricately involved now in realizing the dream, uh, women like Latasha Brown, who's leading Black Voters Matter, and uh, Stacey Abrams and uh, Dr. Bernice A. King, who will be sharing during the march here in Atlanta mm -hmm. Saturday. And I'll call somebody else's name, so I'm not the only name at the end. Keep it Melanie, going. Keep it going. Melanie Campbell. Yes. Um, and uh, wow, there, there's there's so many. Mignon so Moore and and the uh, what do we call them? The color girls. Uh, <laughs> with, yeah, uh, they 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 do it in different ways. Uh, Brindley Patton, I mean, yes. uh, Tamika Mallory. I mean, you know, it's interesting that women have always been present. Uh, but now, you know, I, I prophetically spoke a word back in 2010 that uh, this was not just the year of the right. woman or the decade of the woman. I said, this is the century, the of, the century of the woman. And I, I have that. seen women step up in leadership in powerful ways in every arena. And I'm just amazed. I, I love to watch it. And I, I, I thank God for it. And the thing about women, uh, Dr. Graves, I think you agree, Black women in particular, is that when you have a Black woman, for the most part, there are exceptions to everything, um, when a Black woman is leading, a Black woman takes everybody into the room. Mm -hmm. We are the most inclusive group of people, Absolutely. period, point blank. Um, so I, I just had to lay that out. Uh, cause everybody else kind of has excluded us, you know, yes. other people, but we, yeah. we include everybody. And Dr. King, I like to take it now. I like to take it not in the United States, but around the world, because as I travel yeah. and teach in different countries, most movements were started and sustained by women and especially yeah. black women that were involved in that. So it's not just the United States of America, this is global. And, uh, mm -hmm. if you want something done, give it to a busy black woman and it'll get done. <laughs> That's right. You know, there's a quote uh, there. There was an educator in the uh, 18th century, 19th century named Anna Julia Cooper. And she said, when and where I enter, the entire race enters with me. Right. So to this context, when mm -hmm. and where I enter, talking about women, the entire nation enters with me. Amen so let's to let's that. talk Amen about that quote. Moment. Uh, as we should, whatever we do, Mrs. Coretta Scott King and how she continued to move this dream forward. And we talk about continuing the work of building coalitions and cohesiveness and getting Dr. King's philosophy and methodology of nonviolence, which is, as we see with, as, as, as Mr. Alfin mentioned, was foundational, it's even evident in the I Have a Dream speech, and we'll get to that in a moment. 
how important uh, has Mrs. King been to keeping us connected to this dream and working towards realizing it? So, so I started and I let, Felicia's done a lot of extensive research on my mom and I really appreciate uh, the work that uh, she has done for a young woman. Um, but I just want to just put this in and then I'll let her take it from there because, you know, I, I can talk about my mother all day. Um, I, I'll just say my favorite line. My father was the most hated man in America in 1968. Um, but now he's one of the most loved men in the world. And that's because of Coretta Scott King. In 1963, when they were in Washington, D.C., and he was working on his speech, you know, in the wee, into the wee hours in the morning, she was sitting there with him making contributions you know, throwing out words. Um, a lot of people don't hear about that. We hear about other people who participated um, um, in uh, giving uh, uh, talk, talking to Daddy around that that speech. Nobody really fully wrote that speech. I think he he authored the speech, and oftentimes, uh, majority of his speeches he authored. That's why we have his handwriting <laughs> um, with these speeches. That proves that he actually authored speeches, um, and he would you know, get feedback from other people. You know, how does this sound, you know, play off? My mother played a substantial role in that throughout his preaching life. Um, and, and when she was, you know, present, his speaking life, and sometimes he may even call her. Um, so I want people to know that she she was not this, you know, detached, you know, uh, woman who was not involved um, in the movement. She played a very critical role, even as a, I would, I would call her, you know, one of his foremost advisors. Yeah. So, Kalisha. indeed, you know, uh, in, indeed, Dr. King, you know, when we were talking about um, the, what were the contributions of women to the March on Washington, I was thinking about um, Mrs. King, and, and I tended to mention, you know, we must give credit and honor to those women who were the counsel for the men who had the mics, oh, yeah. if you will. But uh, in terms of Mrs. King's contribution, we could talk all night about that. But what I'll add is that Mrs. King really did institutionalize, as Dr. King says, she's the architect of the King legacy. But and 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 her vision early on, this idea that um, Dr. King's voice, that his words, that 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 the force of who he was needed to have a a a. Uh, portal for sustainability, if you will. I'm thinking about even as early as Montgomery, when his first speech, she slipped somebody a tape recorder and was like, look, tape this, right? Because this is going to be important. So her foresight, the, her ability to see early on that all of this stuff was going to matter, right? But not only matter, but that it needed to be institutionalized so that it could serve as an educational force. Mrs. King um, said early, when you look at her intellectual history, she talks about the philosophy of education and her belief was that the purpose of education ought to be to convey truth, right? So her ability to set up a repository for that when it comes to uh, Dr. King and the civil rights movement is just um, absolutely extraordinary. Yes. Mr. Alphen, you have anything to yes. add? Yes, yes, I would be remiss if I didn't, um, echo what's been said about Mrs. Coretta Scott King. I met her in 81 at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and uh, was introduced and attended my first workshop in 81 at the King Center. She was the, um, she and Mrs. Ferris ran the Institute for a week of, of training. Mrs. Uh, Christine King Ferris is uh, Dr. King's sister. So um, I saw the resistance that uh, some males in Atlanta resented her for starting that Institute, the King Center. I saw how she was able to uh, be persistent and passionate as she raised four children. And some people say, I think Dr. Um, Bernice King will uh, recognize that uh, the King Center was her fifth child. And she spent a tremendous amount of time at that King Center with conflicts, trying to get it uh, stable and stabilized and consistent. And so she was, uh, she was my hero because I've seen when I worked there, when I studied there with her, and then I worked there for four years, I've seen her, how she handles conflict and how she was consistent and how, how stable she was. And without her, um, this institution or the understanding of Dr. King would not be out there because Dr. King was assassinated and Mrs. King built that. Mrs. King and uh, Mrs. Ferris built that institution. So I just wanted to echo and thank you again, Dr. Bernice King, because your family 
has really given me insight and changed my life. Mm. Mm. Hey, amen. <laughs> now, you know, I'm excited about that, Dr. West. I know. <laughs> She's I my know. favorite person. She really is. Well, I, uh, I, I, I tell people all the time, I say, now, Bernice King loves her daddy, but she loves her mama. And if I could offer this, you know, Dr. King talked about the beloved community, but Mrs. King really operationalized what it's that should look it. like. Mm -hmm. exactly. Say she that. Say that. She operationalized it. That's yeah. right. That's right. In <laughs> fact, Nobody really knew a lot about daddy talking about the beloved community until she operationalized it. And she carried that message in her messages around the nation uh, and the world for anybody to even know that Dr. King was talking about it and then elaborated more on, on what it is. I, I wanted to, uh, I know I'm not the host, but I wanted to ask Dr. West, can, can we just kind of highlight, I don't, I don't know if we have anything to show with it, but I think it's important uh, for people to know some of the goals of the March on Washington. Yeah, yes, ma'am. We're about to go there to the Ten okay. Demands. We have yeah. uh, slides. I don't know if we can uh, pull those up and share them, but there were Ten Demands for the March. There we are. Thank you so much, team. Uh, applause for our great production team. Thank you all so much for your work. Uh, the Ten Demands of the March on Washington. We want to connect these, uh, and that's the reason why uh, Dr. Bernie said King wanted us to bring these up and highlight them. Uh, the 10 demands of the March. Let's go to the first one just to take a look at them. A lot of times uh, when we talk about the March, we don't talk about the goals. And so as we're looking at these, uh, Dr. King, Dr. Graves and Mr. Alf, and let's add some comments to connect them to what we see today. They wanted comprehensive and effective civil rights legislation from the present Congress without compromise or here's a word. Filibuster uh. <laughs> <laughs> to guarantee all Americans these four things access to all public accommodations, decent housing, adequate and integrated education, and the right to vote. Lord Jesus. Right to vote. Looks like we fell short on three of those. Three. Just three? <laughs> Just well, three. access to public accommodations, I access think we've done there. pretty well. We're yeah. doing pretty well with that. But, but education we want to, show these to, to the audience because it's so significant when we talk about this dream that Dr. King had when he gave this speech and it's connected to these 10 demands. And then we hear Ambassador Young talking about redeeming the soul of America through eradicating these triple evils. We're connecting the dots yeah. so that we can see this was, wasn't kind of haphazard. It was very strategic with an integration of the principles and steps of nonviolence. So we want to bring that second demand up. I wanted people to know that they saw voting was in there as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Voting, yeah. voting, which continued in Selma, Dr. King, and Mr. Right. Alvin, Dr. Gray. This work, when Ambassador Young mentioned that the, the work in Washington was a continuation of the work in Birmingham, these campaigns weren't disjointed. They yeah. were all flowing together towards a goal so this was uh, mm. one of the, go ahead, sir. Is he, I think you're on mute, Charles, you're on mute. Happened. After that was activated, the accommodations, it was challenged immediately in Atlanta at the mm. uh, restaurant called the Heart of Atlanta, where they said, if you're a private owner, you have a right to uh, uh, have and, and do what you want in your, in your restaurant. And that was overruled by the Supreme Court, said no, you still have to clear, uh, adhere to that private, the private owner, and you serve the, saying you serve the public. So that was uh, was litigated, litigated here in Atlanta at, at the heart of Atlanta Restaurant, where they were challenging private or private owners saying you can do what you want in your in your restaurant. So that was significant uh, through that the first thing through that the uh, accommodations and serving people and discriminating against people. Thank you. Look at some more of the demands here. You put them on me. Withholding of federal funds from all programs in which discrimination exists. That was one demand. The third one was desegregation of all school districts in 1963. Now, we mm -hmm. may think because it's, uh, what are your words you use, Dr. King? De facto and de jure? Well, yeah. Uh, what the movement accomplished was the overcoming mm -hmm. of de jure, de jure, uh, de yes. jure discrimination by law. 
<laughs> but a lot of de facto still exist. Still exist. By practice. So that gets back to that soul force too, because you can change legislation. And your father talked about the need for heart change and legislative change. Mm -hmm. And I believe when we when we hear the I have a dream speech, we can hear that. That he understood we don't we need to change some laws, but we also need some heart change mm -hmm. uh, in order to get to this uh, to achieving this dream. So let's and, let's take uh, a look at the other Dr. dimension. Dr. Okay, if I may say, that word desegregation is always appropriate to, to clarify that because, as you just said, uh, Dr. King said desegregation is the first step, but it's not enough. So therefore, when, when he was talking about beloved community, he was talking about an integration and that desegregation is only a first step on the road to the full society. So therefore, we, we, we kind of interchange that word desegregation and, and integration. Dr. King separated that. He said desegregation is sitting elbow to elbow and uh, living next to people and working next to them. But integration is integration of the heart. It's, it's, it's heart to heart, not elbow to elbow. Wow. And, and just for clarification, it doesn't mean, because he, he clarified that this does not mean that we're to integrate into somebody else's value system. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. I think that's what we lost as a black community. And that, mm -hmm. Dr. King, was what Malcolm X was there. People were mistaken this because he thought Dr. King meant assimilation. Exactly. And that, uh, they're saying that you're assimilating to the macro culture, which was the European. And that was a big misunderstanding with Malcolm because Dr. King mm -hmm. was not talking about assimilation. Listen, yes. audience, do you hear? Dr. How King is? was talking about a revolution of values. Yes. 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 Hear how we're talking about these demands? Because we really want uh, hope for us to understand the holistic approach to this march and the things that they were demanding then and how they connect to today. These are things that still legislatively and in our hearts and, and with soul force and understanding that we need some policy change as well. Uh, we want to ensure that these things are happening. Let's take a look at the, the other demands. Enforcement of the 14th Amendment, reducing congressional representation of states where citizens are disenfranchised. A new executive order banning discrimination in all housing supported by federal funds. Isn't it amazing how we've rarely seen these demands? But when we think about nonviolence and, and Dr. King's philosophy and methodology of nonviolence, it's essential that before we even start to talk about direct action that we've negotiated and said, here's what we're looking for. Now, now Dr. West also on that fair housing, in 1968, there was some action moved on that. So that mm -hmm. contributed to the March on Washington, the, the, the yes. uh, Fair Housing Act of 1968 that level the playing field for financing and purchasing, renting, et cetera. So that's another uh, spring off of that uh, March on Washington. Yes, sir. So there would be three acts that would be connected back to this march, correct? Is that Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then the Fair Housing Act of 1968? That's the three. Want to confirm yes. with the panel that we yes. have <laughs> yes. the three right. Excellent. Thank you for that, Mr. Alvin. Authority for the attorney, uh, the attorney general to institute injunctive suits when any constitutional right is violated. That was a demand. A massive federal program to train and place all unemployed workers, Negro and white, on meaningful and dignified jobs at decent wages. And then this next one, we're still seeing today, it feels like this, 1963 is now a, a National Minimum Wage Act that will give all Americans a decent standard of living. This is a, a foundational uh, Kenyan idea that there should be a livable wage. And this is something that Mrs. Coretta Scott King continued to work for uh, as a part of her work to realize Dr. King's dream. And let's talk about how uh, much foresight they had because the minimum wage, I believe, at the time was about a dollar fifteen or dollar ten somewhere around there, and they wanted to mm -hmm. increase it to two dollars, which in $2 today's world is seventeen dollars. So we're not asking mm -hmm. for enough, but we right. know that ultimately the call is for livable wages. Excellent, thank you, Dr. King. 
And there was a one before that. Could we go back one slide? Thank you so much. A broad and fair labor, labor standards act to include all areas of employment which are presently excluded. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And a Federal Fair Employment Practices Act barring discrimination by federal, state, and municipal governments and by employers, contractors, employment agencies, and trade unions. We just saw a case um, with uh, Byron Allen, I believe, Dr. King, that connected back to that demand. Right. right? which we saw that demand addressed in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Yeah, and Dr. King, that's why the, the AFL and CIO participated, because Dr. King felt that that's where we can get a little foothold on, on desegregation is through the labor unions, because they represent their, mem their members. So Dr. King would always include labor in all the things that he did. In other words, those other, um, those other groups that were mentioned but labor was certainly one. And A. Philip Randolph was the president of the, of the Pullman Porters Union. And that was the word of blacks uh, served the trains. And that's why he was in Washington. And he was the president of that uh, Brotherhood of Pullman Porters. You, you know what's intriguing, Mr. Allison, Dr. Graves, Dr. King, is that sometimes when we're discussing, uh, like Dr. King mentioned universal basic income, a guaranteed wage. And often when we, when we share about that, people make it seem as though he was for people not working because they don't understand that he was for labor. He believed in fair labor, that all labor had dignity. So uh, just a moment for us to connect back for people that, that Dr. King believed in uh, fair labor, labor non-discriminatory labor, equity in the workplace, but he was for eradicating poverty. And so he was uh, looking at this wage as a way to get to the eradication of poverty. I just wanted to convey that because there's, I think, um, a willful misunderstanding of what he was articulating. That we just need to be sure that people aren't hungry and that people have livable wages. And those were demands of the March on Washington. Now, if you're on social media and uh, you, this is your first time hearing these 10 demands, we want you to tweet that and share that. We'll share them on social media tomorrow, but we want you to tweet and share using hashtag beloved community talks that you just heard the 10 demands of the March on Washington during the King Center's virtual experiences. That's important, educating ourselves and educating other people around these issues. You know, Dr. West, if we take a high level view of this, um, you know, as one who's come up in the school system in this nation, a lot of times what we see is the spectacle of the civil rights movement without taking a step back to understand that it wasn't just about the spectacle of marching or, 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 or making noise, right? But that this was a movement that had plans and agendas for what mm -hmm. change should look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not about the spectacle. Right, that that was about ten percent of of what they did. Ninety percent was how do we craft out? You know how much research it takes to to craft out ten agendas. So yeah. I think it's important to highlight that this wasn't a movement that was just about spectacle, right? But it was a movement that had plans and agenda for what change should look like, and that's a critical lesson we should take today. Yes. Yes, and Dr. West, one quick thing about the history of uh, that. Black folks are lazy and don't want to work. Uh, I can remember when uh, welfare came out and they began to project that welfare was for black people, that every time you saw a welfare person, uh, he or she was black, especially with uh, she being black. And so that's the media and the politics that, that created that. There's more white people on welfare than black. And so that even today when they talk about it, they want to project us as uh, just uh, living off the government and don't want to work, but that is not so. Even in welfare, you couldn't have a man in the house. If somebody, if they called a man in the house, they would take you off of welfare. So all these laws have been generated so that it's political and people believe it because they see it on the media. And that's why step one is so important of getting our facts and knowing our history. Where did this come from? There's a history, there's a history that all the beginning of all these things that we're seeing now in 2021. Now I'm gonna be like Mahalia Jackson. Go ahead, Dr. King, and I'm gonna be like Mahalia. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, everybody wasn't on the same page coming into this march. 
Um, mm. and, and, and I'm speaking to that because today, oftentimes people are on different pages. Um, uh, and yet we know there's power in oneness and unity, not talking about uniformity. Um, uh, and when this first started out, uh, there was a little hesitancy initially by NAACP and Urban League, in fact, at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a story behind why that is, um, but I, I don't want to go into that because that takes too much time. But the fact of the matter is when that day came, they were there, they were present, they were part of the big six that signed on, including, you know, uh, labor. Now, national labor overall, the United Auto Workers uh, was there, represented by Walter Ruther, who spoke. Um, uh, but a lot of the national labor did not. Some of the local labor unions did. Um, and obviously, I had to talk about the faith communities. But even Malcolm X, who criticized it, my understanding is he attended. I, I don't know. I did some research. Um, <laughs> so what I'm saying is we've got to find out, because in that day, the majority of the main organizations that kind of represented uh, the voice of the people, the, the voice of the streets that represented civil rights at that time and human rights, the main ones came together um, at this march. Um, it's a little different this time. And, and I know that's the elephant in the room, but I have to say something as Dr. King's daughter and the one who knows how important it is for us to overcome our, you know, our divisions um, to really, you know, transcend because the issue is too critical. You know, the issue of voting rights is too critical for us to have too many camps. We've got to figure out how to coordinate and not just collaborate, but coordinate better together um, mm -hmm. because we, we are fighting a ferocious enemy right now. And I'm not speaking of people, it's just the power of that, that force that has continued through generations uh, to want to continue to exploit it and impress people and to deny people. Um, so some kind of way, no matter what those divisions are, let's learn from history. They, they put that aside in that moment. <laughs> uh, and as vicious, I, I forget the words that Malcolm even called the, the march, a farce or something, some kind of mar uh, farce on Washington or something. Um, he was there. And, and, and we got to figure out how to pull together like that when we are doing these different um, undemonstrated. Don't mean everybody has to physically be there. That's not what I'm saying. But we got to figure out how to support it in different ways. Because some people, as you said, Dr. Gray's research, you know, some people are educating in other ways, but we just got to make sure that we are together because there's power when you come together in, in, in oneness. And Dr. King, if I may add about Malcolm X, uh, it, was, it was the way your father responded to Malcolm because Malcolm came to Selma in 65 and spoke at Brown Chapel. So therefore, we have to make sure we understand Malcolm and how these principles, how these principles work, even in conflict. So it was the response your father gave to all the criticism that he was uh, up under uh, nationally and internationally. So those principles that he developed, not only did he develop them, but he applied them, the principles and the steps. Yes, he did. Thank you. Now I'm like Mahalia. Tell us about the dream, King, as we uh, close our conversation today. Uh, certainly, we want to leave people with some action steps. And, and we've heard about coalition building, being cohesive. Uh, Dr. Bernie Say King just shared about the need for us to come together. And I know she wants to share more about, we want to share more, Dr. King, about organizing our strength into compelling power. But as we, we close our conversation today, let's, let's talk a bit about this dream by way of sharing some parts of the dream and then sharing some action steps. Because what Dr. King did, I believe, is he laid out a condition. He said, we're here to dramatize a shameful condition. And then he somewhat prophetically said, this is where we are now, but I have a dream that one day we will be here. So let's yeah. talk about Dr. Graves, Mr. Alfin, and Dr. King. Let's close out by sharing with people uh, a component of the dream or something he said in the dream and something we can do to take action today. Uh, when Dr. King said uh, we will not be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. And we think today about the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act and other legislation. What can we do to actualize that dream? Is it still organizing? 
uh, or to shift that shameful condition into the realization of that dream? Is it still organizing our strength, Dr. King? Yeah, I mean, I, that's that's been my one. I'm like, that's my John the Baptist message. You know, John the Baptist <laughs> only had one message, repent. <laughs> that's it. That was that his first that's it. Last that, 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 that's my, my first, my second, my third, and et cetera uh, sermon. Uh, we, we've got, the key here is organizing our strength. You know, all of us are very passionate about different issues, um, but we can't just take passion to organize around. We got to really look at where does your strength lie? Some people are great researchers. Some people are great articulators, um, spokespersons. Um, some people are great educators. They can sift through all of this. Um, some people are great writers. Uh, some people are great mobilizers. Uh, they, they're just so many people. There's just so many elements uh, that, that are needed. Uh, some people are great with logistics. We got to organize these strengths. Sometimes we, everybody wants to just march. And as Dr. Gray said, 90% of what Daddy and them did was around the strategy and planning and people bringing their strengths to the table because it all works together for the good. You know, nothing is less important than the other. Those people who provided food or those people who pass out leaders or those people who provide the messaging, you know, are just as critical as the ones who may articulate and speak the message. Um, and so we, I think going forward, I keep saying this because I, until I see it, I see collaboration. I'm in meetings where people are talking about what they're doing in this corner and that corner and that corner. What I'm not seeing is let's stop and say, okay, how do we better coordinate these activities so that we're just not doing things but there's a strategy to it. So do we really need to do this right now or do we need this to happen right now? Hold up on this and do this at this particular time or do we need to elevate this at this point and strengthen this at this point? I mean, and really respect that kind of protocol because we got to yield. That means yielding, you know, because we just all want to be busy and busyness is not going to get us there, unfortunately. Uh, strategy, strength, structure, coordination in our collaboration is really what's going to get us there. And nonviolence helps us with that. So please come to our trainings. I'm just, um, I, I think they can be very helpful. I'm, I'm very serious about yeah. that. I think they can be very helpful. And I'd like to also really uh, accent, reiterate that training because that's the key that made Dr. King. It was a training that the students understood what Dr. King was talking about. But I will quote from Mrs. King because I'm talking to most of the students now and they think that we fixed things in the 60s and why we got to go over and do it again. But Mrs. King uh, had a quote that said, struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And this generation uh, will have a struggle as all generations. So therefore we can't get a, uh, lose our hope because we're saying nothing has been accomplished. A lot has been accomplished like you heard tonight. So therefore the young people, we, we have a struggle and it's a continuous struggle according to Mrs. Curtis Scott King. So we need your help because the young people were in the streets. The civil rights bill was not passed in the courts like uh, Dr. King says in his autobiography, it was passed in the streets. So therefore, we right. have to understand the system and understand how the system works and be able to change it. Dr. King understood the Constitution. And so we need a lot of work to do, but we can do this. I am no way pessimistic. Can I toss this to Dr. Graves? I know we got to well, close. Let, I know we're out of time. Moment, I want to summarize what we said so we can go and then get our third action item from Dr. Graves as we close out. because We have to close out in just a moment. But Dr. King talked about what organizing our strength and she talked about being educated on our strengths so we can be well coordinated. So that's one thing we need to do. Know your strengths and when you get ready to organize and we get in these meetings to coordinate, coordinate based on those strengths. And then Mr. Alphen reiterated what Dr. King mentioned about training. Be educated and trained. Coordinate and know your strengths. Be educated and trained. And then we want to talk to you, Dr. Graves, for a third action item as we close out our conversation today. Dr. King, I know you had something before. Yeah, I'm just going to really just reiterate what Uncle Andy said, which is very important, that we got to continue working quietly, sustainably, consistently, in other words, 
and recognize that the alpha said nothing comes easy because that's what happened. Mm. We stopped working quietly. We weren't having sustained action over time and we forgot that it ain't easy. Yeah. Go ahead. That's good, Dr. King. I'm sorry. I thought you were tossing it to Dr. Graves, but you had some additional things to add there. Thank you. After I say this, I'm going to toss it back to Dr. King. But, um, <laughs> you know, young, young people have exponential jurisdiction over the future. And so I think about everything through the prism of education. And as I said earlier, the civil rights movement wasn't just about the spectacle. It was about the plans and the agenda. And so even when we think about education in this country, every level of education um, needs, we need to be thinking about how can we organize our young people's brains toward policy writing, right? We, we talk about what the future should look like. We talk about how can we extend the legacy of the March on Washington and the civil rights movement. I think uh, as an educationalist that policy writing should be an embedded learning outcome at every level of education in this nation, right? So that we can begin to, to point our young people in that direction, but also to help to, to organize their brains around how they can practically execute and achieve change. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, so we had these three action items, organize, coordinate uh, based on our strengths, education and training, and then I think it's policy writing, paying attention to policy and developing policy. Those are three key things that we want you to take away from uh, how the, the dream and the march influence and impact us today and how we can carry forward the work of realizing the dream. There's some work that each of us can do, or as, as Ambassador Young said, uh, there's a way of life that each of us can mm -hmm. participate in. He said it's more than work for him, it's a way of life. We're so grateful for you being a part of this experience on behalf of Dr. Bernie Say King, who there she is, you see her right there. Uh, thank you <laughs> so much for being a part of this beloved Community Talks experience. Thank you to Flo and Du Bois. Thank you so much for uh, providing the pro bono American Sign Language and to the production team. Dr. King, as we close, did you have any anything else you wanted to say as we wrap up? I, I just, I, yeah, yeah, I think we, I think we're good. I hope you have been inspired by everything that you heard tonight and let's, let's just go. Let's, let's keep moving let's forward. Go. Let's, con let's continue let's to move. Let's do it. That's right. Let's continue the movement. The dream has yet to be realized. Let's keep working. Thank you so much. And we invite you to be a part of our beloved community talks tomorrow at 6 PM streaming in the same place. And we invite you to take the Be Love Pledge and be a part of the Be Love Movement. Again, we honor you and we thank you. Have a good day, good evening, good night. Let us march on ballot boxes until somehow we will be able to develop that day. And men will have food and material necessities for their bodies, freedom and dignity for their spirit, education and culture for their mind. Let us march on ballot boxes until men and women will no longer walk the streets in search for jobs that do not exist. Let us march on ballot boxes until the empty stomachs of Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, Louisiana, and South Carolina to feel. Let us march on ballot boxes. Until the idle industries of Appalachia to revitalize. Let us march on battle boxes until brotherhood is more than a meaningless word at the end of a prayer, but the first order of business on every legislative agenda. Let us march on ballot boxes. <laughs> <laughs>